Happy Mushoku Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trek through the Mushoku Tensei Jabba's Reincarnation novel series. We are on volume 12, chapter 14. I have completed volume 12. It is done, boys. <laughs> so we have technically three more chapters to go through. I'm really hoping that I can get all these done in this one. This will be the final Mushoku Monday for volume 12, but as per usual, just based on the pacing and everything, there is a lot, lot of dialogue to go through with these next two chapters. The final chapter broke me. <laughs> it really broke me. That's my big massive question mark right now for this Mashoko Monday. Even if I do make it to that chapter, if I'm going to be able to get through it, because it was extremely, extremely emotional. I was literally reading, like, a line, and then I would take a break, and then I would come back, and I'd read a line, and I would take a break. <laughs> it was just, it was no bueno. I really did not like that last chapter, but for not bad reasons, just personal reasons, but... Yes, without further ado, let's uh, get through the usual. Thanks, everybody, for dropping by for the premiere. Hey, chat. Love you guys. Additionally, thanks to everybody that supports the channel monetarily or tells other people about it. Supporting through just kind words. All that stuff means so much to me. As per usual, again, <laughs> Nicholas and Noah, you guys are crazy. I uh, really do appreciate the outpour of support. It means so much to me. It keeps this stuff going. And I could not do it without you guys. But yeah, with all that said... Let us jump into chapter 14, report. Everything went by in a frenzy after returning home. Aisha fetched Norn from school. Roxy left to get geese and the others. He figured that she felt a little awkward <laughs> being around there right now with the whole situation. Ellen only seemed anxious to see Cliff, but she resisted the temptation, which I think is really cool. <laughs> she knows that Rudius is about to deliver some really bad news that's going to affect her granddaughter. And yes, I think she wants to be there to support Rudius as well. It's really nice to see that she's willing to put others before her own self. Reese passed the time asking Silphy what had happened since he left. He was sure that she wanted to know how the adventure gone, but she didn't complain. Her pregnancy was moving along smoothly, and her child would be born on time. The others were doing good as well. And this is kind of interesting, and then Ahoshi resolved an incident that happened in the school a few days ago. <laughs> so, like, despite the fact that she's been shutting for so long, she is showing signs that she cares about what's going on outside, and she's willing to help people. Nanahoshi has changed a lot. Rudeus even thought something about her has changed to want to help people in this world. Nor and Aisha hadn't gotten sick or injured. They were both doing well. Aisha's gardening had taken off and she was even growing some in her room. You know what's in that room. The, the, the illegal stuff. The, the illegal stuff's in her room. Aisha wouldn't do that. Yes, yeah, she would. Now, here's a cool thing. Norm was gradually becoming like an idol figure in the school, having spawned something akin to a fan club. Yeah, this is... We're talking about... Again, she's got the blood of, of Zenith inside of her, man. She's gonna be looking good. I mean, Paul was a good looking dude too. So she's got some good genes in her. I mean, Rudeus is experiencing that himself. He's got some good genes. Rudeus figured it made sense because how cute she was. But that's a nice thing too. It's kind of showing that people are very accepting of Norn. She's not the outcast. Again, a lot of her issues where she locked herself up was around her misunderstanding of Rudeus. It wasn't because she was bullied. Zenoba, Cliff, Linnea, and Priscilla popped in occasionally to check in. Ariel? Ariel? <laughs> I called it! I called it! Ariel had apparently complained that Rudius said nothing before leaving. She was the one that he, he was talking about before he left. He's like, I think I'm missing somebody. And at the time, I was thinking it's going to be Ariel or it would be Linnea and Persena. Because at the time, Linnea and Persena, the last time he talked to them in the novel, was saying specifically he was telling them he was going to be gone for years. He was going to travel by foot all the way down there. And it was going to take forever. And they were like, they were pretty much saying goodbye because they would be graduating before he even got back. I never had him going back and saying, don't worry, it's not gonna be that long. I figured out another way to travel. So yes, it ended up coming down to Ariel. She was the one that was mad. <laughs> I wanna see pouty face Ariel at some point. Like this part in the in the anime, just have it cut over to Ariel and she's got this pouty face. And yes, I mean, that technically is a little bit bad for her because again, she's supposed to be using Ruiz's name for her own benefit. And so if she <laughs> sells people, yes, Rudius Grey Rat's back, I mean, they're like, that dude's gone. What are you talking about? He's not even here. At any rate, everyone was okay. He would have to go and inform them of his return when he had time. Sadly, the only one that remained unaccounted for was Bodyguard. I was really hoping that he'd come back. Like, he comes back and then suddenly, yeah, Bodyguard, he's back and he's causing a big uproar. But no, he's still gone. Ruiz thought he was immortal, so he doubt anything bad happened to him. Ruiz stopped flagging. <laughs> Stop flagging. Sylphie was adorable, putting her finger to her chin as she recalled the past six months. Wrapping things up, she inquired on what happened with his journey. He promised that he would tell her everything once everyone was there. Yeah, this is one of those sucky things where you kind of want to let somebody know what's, what they're kind of expecting. Like, okay, just between you and me, this is going to be really rough. Here's kind of what we're going to be going over. But at the same time, 
recounting something so painful as to what's all happened to Rudius, again, he doesn't regret it, but it was painful. And having to recount that multiple times to multiple people, I had that same issue when I lost my father and I went back to work and literally everybody was asking me what happened. And it's like, at some point I got tired of saying what happened. And yes, everybody that did know what happened, they were asking me how it was doing. And it's like, at some point you just get, <laughs> you get sick of repeating the same thing over and over again, or just trying to make sure that people don't worry about you and having to tell them a bunch of lies or white lies to calm their nerves. And yes, while some of them I don't think are close enough to me that they care that much, I don't want to assume that. But again, it sucks to have to say it over and over again. Just then, Roxy returned with the others. Oh, you must be Boss's wife. Heh <laughs> you sure are cute. Boss, you're a lucky one. <laughs> Geese. <laughs> Ellen Lee spoke up. That's my granddaughter. Yep, and if not for her slutty granny, she'd be perfect. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Ignoring them, the rest of the party greeted Sylphie. Roxy spoke up first. Hey, pleasure. I am Roxy McGurdia. Roxy, as in the master that Rudy is always boasting about? Yes, that one. Although I'm not special enough to be warrant such boasting. Well, pleasure to meet you. I've heard so much about you from Rudy. Yes, I'm Sylphiet. It's an honor. Y yes, for me as well. Roxy was obviously seeming awkward. Probably due to the fact they're going to be having a conversation about her joining the family. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot that you're kind of going through your head like, oh, how's this going to go? Okay, th things are going well right now. <laughs> Lilia spoke up. It's been a while, Mr. Sylphiet. Yes, it has been, Miss Lilia. Sylphie seemed delighted. Lips threatened to break into a smile, but it turned bitter quickly. Um, no need for Mr. Sylphiet. Could you just call me Sylphie? As you did long ago? No, I cannot treat you as I did before. Not now that you've wed Lord Rudius. Oh, oh, right. I still hate this. <laughs> I said it last time, I'm gonna say it again. Somebody needs to break this from Lilia. I, I do like her professionalism. Don't get me wrong. I do think that Lilia has been molded into this perfect maid, basically. But the problem is that it's been so long that she has not been that. She has been family. And I hate that it still hasn't broken out. Now, granted, the thread that kind of ties them through blood as being technically family, which is Paul, has been severed. But that doesn't change the fact that she is family. Despite Paul being gone, she is family. I hate that coldness. Somebody just needs to say, no, you're going to be calling me this. <laughs> Now, of course, why this is heartbreaking is that, yeah, Lilia had taught her everything that she knew about housework. And Rudius put it in a good way. Lilia was technically master to Sylph yet, like Roxy was to him. Of course, she respected Lilia. Here it comes. <laughs> okay, here it comes. It's already, it's already starting. Uh, it's been a while, Miss Zenith. Uh, Miss Zenith? Zenith stared blankly. Sylphie looked at Rudius, troubled, like she was worried Zenith wasn't pleased by his marriage. <laughs> Again, misunderstanding. Shut up. <laughs> just just cut the misunderstanding stuff out. I don't even want to read it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Zenith. This whole time, Zenith has been blank-faced, and she's been waiting for this moment, because when she was in the crystal, she had insight into what would have happened since she was gone, and the moment she broke out, she's been quiet because she's been mad this whole time. She's not even sorrowful for Paul's death. She's just the entire time thinking, damn it, Rudius, why'd you marry that girl? That green-haired girl. <laughs> Secretly, Zenith is a massive <laughs> it's like a prejudice. So finally, Zenith speaks up right here and she's like, yes, I'm really mad that he married you. <laughs> Sylphie, I'll explain about my mother and father once Norn gets here. Oh, yes, I don't see Mr. Paul here. Glancing around, she didn't take long before she knew what happened. The room fell silent as they waited for Norn to return. After a bit, Aisha and Norn return, both breathless from the run. B Big brother, welcome back from your long trip. Seeing his hand, Norn panicked. Is, is your hand okay? It's fine. It's an inconvenience, but it doesn't hurt. Compared to everything else they had to discuss, it wasn't hardly noteworthy. Everyone went inside and took their seats. Aisha offered some tea, which made sense because it was going to be a long conversation. She denied Sylphie the offer to help. You know what's happening? I knew immediately what's happening right here. She's got mom is in the room. <laughs> Aisha's like, no, no, I got it. I got it. Mom's watching. <laughs> she went to work, readying the tea, gathering everyone's luggage, hanging coats, and replacing their wet shoes with slippers. Lilia watched in silence, not raising a finger. A rare sight. Lilia spoke up. Aisha. Yes, what is it, mother? It seems you're attending your duties properly and not causing trouble for your brother. Yes, you may not be related to Lord Rudis by blood, but it was he who saved your life. Keep that in mind as you continue to carry out your duties as a maid. Yes, mother. <laughs> I hate this stuff. <laughs> Treat somebody like a figurehead rather than an actual sibling, just based on this occurrence. I do like that she is still, in her mind, acknowledges that Rudius saved Aisha's life. 
but we're so far past this by this time. Can we now break those barriers? And I mean, that was the whole situation with Lilia being gone and Aisha coming there. As she was trying to be like Lilia, she was trying to be the best maid ever. But at some point, Rudius kind of opened the door for her. Be selfish. Tell me what you want. I want you to act like a child at some point. It's like Aisha had never had a childhood. She wasn't allowed to have a childhood. And he kind of wanted to open the door to let her have a childhood. But Lilia's different. Lilia just keeps seeing duty. This is what you have to do. It's what you have to do. Which it in itself is an aspect of love. Don't get me wrong. I do kind of see an aspect of doing a good job of what you're doing to serve somebody is in some respects, not forced servitude, but in some respects is love in itself. But it's still heartbreaking, especially for, again, Aisha's still a child. Aisha sounded formal, like Lilia. It didn't feel right hearing a child talk like that. This was their first, and this, is, I did, this didn't hit me until later, and I'm like, holy crap, I forgot about this because it got into this other conversation. It was their first time seeing each other for a while. Again, Lilia and Aisha have been separated for quite a while. It felt like they should be warmer to each other, but he thought perhaps Lilia was just restraining herself. It was going to be a painful conversation after all. That's a good point, and they sort of talk about this later. Not a good time to celebrate. This conversation is gonna suck, and to have that celebration beforehand might look bad. I don't think it's bad. But it probably would look bad to some people's eyes. Since everyone's gathered, why don't we start? His heart was heavy, but it was his duty since Paul was no longer there. Norn spoke up. But father's not here yet. Rudius thought, would she be angry with him? He told Norn that he would handle everything. She probably would blame him. It was fine if she did. He was the one that failed to grant her wish. Our father, Paul Greyrat, is dead. Norn's eyes went wide and her fists curled tight. Sylphie's head lowered with a look of heartbreak. This is what he left behind. He placed the belongings and the remains on the table. Norn spoke up. Well, why? But you went. Why did he die? I'm sorry. I wasn't strong enough. But you're... She stepped close in fury, probably to grab his collar. But her fury suddenly lost steam. She looked at his lost hand, the belongings, and then to his face. Tears were welling up in her eyes. Rudius covered his left wrist and then continued. I'll explain in more detail right now. She sniffled and then muttered an okay. Aisha grabbed her shoulder. For now, enough, I know. Smacking Aisha's hand away, Norn returned to her seat. After an idle moment, Aisha returned behind Sylphie. Rudeus then summarized everything that happened. Ellen Lace and him going to Rapon, reuniting with Paul, findings in its whereabouts, mapping the teleportation labyrinth, things running smoothly before running into the Guardian. How the fight was rough. Losing his hand, losing Paul, rescuing Zenith, her being a husk. He slowly ran through everything as geese supplied additional information now and then. Norn spoke up. So that means you weren't able to save mother or father. That's right. Surprisingly, she didn't explode in response. She bit her lower lip and stared at his missing hand. I think there's an aspect of her acknowledging that he lost something. Now, yes, I know that she acknowledges that Rudius lost Paul too, but I do believe that she doesn't know how close Rudius got to Paul in that last moment. Like, she doesn't know that Rudius, in his mind, has connected himself to Paul now. She has always seen Rudius as disconnected from Paul. Everybody in this family has acknowledged the disconnect that Rudius has had with the family. So I honestly think right here, her looking at his missing hand, is her seeing, okay, you didn't come back whole. So I know that you at least tried, that you were there, that you tried, you lost something. You were fighting for even your own life. So I think that's why she didn't blow up. She continued, did you do everything you could? Yeah, I gave it all I had. If you tried that hard and you still failed, then it wouldn't have mattered if... Her voice was calm, but trailed off, tears falling from her eyes. I'm sure it wouldn't have mattered. Father is gone. Tears were streaming down her face as she began to sob. She was crying loudly, her voice piercing through his heart. I really do think that, um, I really do think that she right here is expressing that if I went, it wouldn't have changed anything. If you failed, if you, Rudius, went there and yes, tried everything and wasn't just standing on the sidelines again, the proof that he was in the battle is right there. It's missing. Then it wouldn't matter if I went. It wouldn't have mattered if I was there because I couldn't do anything that you couldn't have done. She's acknowledging that no matter what, Paul was going to die. 
Now, if she went, he probably would have, <laughs> she could have probably dragged him away and said, dad, we're not doing this. But, um, oh, it sucks. It sucks. This is what I wasn't looking forward to is Norn's response, this whole thing. And it sucks because eventually it will get stained in a way. She's accepting it right now. And it sucks that she's accepting it now, but she won't be able to accept it later because something ruins the situation. In a way. Everyone wore grave expressions as Norn's body shook as she sobbed. She cried all the tears the rest of them hadn't. Eyes red, but filled with determination. Everybody else is too strong. Everybody else doesn't want to show it. Everybody else has experienced it. There's so many. I can pretty much go through every character and apply why I think they're not breaking. Lilia, she knows she has a duty at the moment. Rudius technically already broke. And so he doesn't need to do it again. Now, I do see that sometimes you'll break multiple times, especially when you see the sorrow of somebody else after you've already had your sorrow. Aisha, I don't think really connected much with Paul. Sylphie wasn't connected much with Paul, but I think she's sorrowful for Rudius, but she's keeping it inside. Sylphie has always been good at keeping it inside. Master Fitz. And Elise has seen it so much. So on and so forth. Again, after some time, she turned to Rudius, eyes filled with determination. Big brother. Y yes, what is it? The sword. Can I have it? It was the one that Paul had on his side his whole life. Yeah, sure. You should take it. Just don't use it recklessly. Huh? Don't mistake having that sword as a sign that you've suddenly gotten stronger. Paul had said the same thing. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Paul had said the same thing to Rudius when he gave him a sword at the age of five. I, I understand. She hugged it close to her chest. She was strong. Most of her age. I didn't think I'd get this. <laughs> I didn't think I'd be breaking at this point of the story. She was strong. Most her age would hole up in a room and cry. Yet she was facing the loss head on. Unlike Rudius, who couldn't crawl back on his feet without Roxy. I think it's a different story for Rudius. I don't, I don't think Rudius gives himself enough credit here. Or lack thereof. Depending on how you want to word it. Rudius wasn't experienced just the loss of Paul. He was experiencing the loss of his past, his past family. And yes, coming to grips with the fact that he was failing once again. Oh, yeah. I forgot about this part. <laughs> this is the part that broke me. They split up his belongings to their family. Isa chose his short sword, Rudius, his armor. The remains would be buried in a proper grave. That was the plan before Zenith walked forward and took his armor. His armor into her hands. There's still something in there. Dealing with something like this, seeing a sign that there's something there is such, sadly, a massive rewarding experience. When you see that there's a sign that they still acknowledge something, it's like a light at the end of a very dark tunnel. Like suddenly, hope. Suddenly, a reminder that everything you did up, a reminder that everything you've done at that point had meaning. Like I was right, there was something in there. One of these days we're gonna have a magical Monday where Andrew's not a bumbling idiot. Rudia spoke up. Mother? She didn't respond. She just blankly stared ahead like a husk. Yet she moved as if she understand what was going on here. Was it just coincidence? No, perhaps the core of who she was still remained. There's not a damn chance that she walked up there and grabbed that. Now, yes, you can make some argument that there's a possibility that everybody grabbing stuff off this table, she's like, okay, well, I'm going to grab something too. Because they have mentioned the idea before that Zenith is doing good and just kind of following instructions. She's not choosing for herself, but she's following instructions. Key thing, though, she's not choosing for herself. This is a choice. That's my husband. Rius was left with nothing. Rius was left with nothing, but he was satisfied with that. He received so much from him already. God, I love these types of acknowledgements. I love them every time. Well then, let's talk about Mother next. After explaining her empty state, Sylphie spoke up. She won't get any better? I don't know. He intended to have the doctors and healers examine her, but he never heard of healing magic restoring lost memories. They still don't know what the root cause of it was. 
only that she was encased in a magically imbued crystal and lost her memories. It could be akin to a deficiency of oxygen. If there was damage to her brain, the medical technologies of this world wouldn't be enough to fix it. Even advanced tier magic had done nothing. He did read in manga that there was cases of having the same level of shock would kind of bring people back, but he couldn't test that on Zenith. Yeah, we can... <laughs> you technically could. Hey, Nanahoshi, I need another displacement incident. <laughs> Hopefully she'll end up in a crystal again. That's dark. He wasn't sure if she'd be happy if they cured her. Paul died saving her. She'd surely blame herself, but no, that wasn't right. They should work to restore her memories. Yeah, that's not an excuse to keep her a husk. Please don't do that. Um, she has to accept it just like you did. And I think her having this family is enough purpose for her to keep moving forward. He informed everyone that Zenith would need treatment and care, that he planned to have her live in this home. He did wonder if he would have taken care of his parents in his previous life, if they had become bedridden. Which yes, I think yourself back then, probably not. Self now, for damn sure. While well, Lily was planning on actually having a separate place because she didn't want to burden him, he shot that down quickly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rudius. Even if she had the funds to actually do it. I mean, she could technically live for like a decade by herself with all the money they got. And yeah, he's specifically saying in this town. I'm sure if she went somewhere else, she probably could live the rest of her life, but it's a little more expensive here, I would assume. Rudius wouldn't allow it. Paul wouldn't allow it. It was his duty as her remaining family. While Lily would be entrusted with her care, he wanted everyone to lend a hand. Sylvia agreed to help as well. No one seemed to disagree. Not that he intended on letting them. <laughs> Rudy is turning into the man of the house. He's like, yeah, you're all going to help. Objections? Didn't think so. <laughs> Didn't think so. Paul told him to save Zenith, even if it killed him. Even now, he didn't truly know what he meant by that. But now that he was gone, Rudius had to protect Zenith. Aisha spoke up with a voice of confusion and anxiety. So this means mother will be living with us as well? Yes, Aisha, I will be in Lord Rudius's service. Rudius thought, did Aisha see Lilia as a thorn in her side? She was strict with her growing up. He got a sense that Aisha was happy living away from her mother. He'd have to correct her if she expressed displeasure. It didn't feel appropriate. This was the, this was a total broadside moment right here. I just, I was so focused on this other stuff. And then when this happened, it just completely punched me right in the face. I suppressed on. Will we be splitting up the work as well? We can discuss that later. I intend on making the mistress's care my primary focus. Leaving the majority of the housework to you, Aisha. All right. Aisha seemed gloomy and her face was stiff. It didn't seem that she was comfortable having her mother being present. Before this, okay, yes, I do acknowledge this idea like I mentioned earlier. Aisha was freedom here. Finally, I get to be with Kennel Master. I'm gonna get with him just like mom got with Paul, pretty much. She loved Rudius, and she wanted to devote everything, her body and everything, to Rudius. She was raised that way, but eventually realized how cool he was, and then she was happy that she was raised that way, and now she has this. But again, I think there was a side of her that wanted freedom, that she wanted these certain things, and mother would not let her. Like the plants. That's what she wanted to do, but mother never let her. And suddenly she had the two things she wanted, taste of freedom and the one that she wanted to serve. And now mom's back. The mom that keeps telling her, stop, treat Norn better. You're supposed to do this. You're not family, you're the maid. And now she's back, she's back. But I wasn't expecting where it goes. Norn noticed that she was uncomfortable and put her hand on her shoulder and whispered, you don't have to hold back on our account, okay? I was like, what? like, what? Rudius does it too. He's like, what? Aisha looked to Norn, then to Lilia, then to Rudius. He wasn't sure what she was looking to him for approval or what to approve, but he nodded nonetheless. Aisha, Aisha hopped onto her feet and threw her arms around Lilia. My mother, mother, I'm so glad you're safe. She bawled, burying her face in Lilia's stomach. I'm home now, Aisha. Lilia's expression turned gentle as she stroked her daughter's head. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> so good. She died. I mean, it makes sense. Remember the Aisha, a lot of the Aisha's chapters towards the later part was expressing how Aisha was appreciative of Lilia in the end. She didn't like Lilia for the longest time. She never let me have fun. Then she realized it was all for something good. It's a messed up mindset. Like I mentioned back there, it's a messed up mindset that you would never have a childhood and you'd be forced to learn how to serve somebody and then you would serve them. But again, part of me was saying, but that's this world. 
a maid's going to train their children to the same thing they are. It's just what they do. But also the fact that she never had a childhood and that her mother was putting her through all this stuff. But it made sense in the context of Aisha. She eventually said, if this didn't happen, I would never be good enough. Thank you, mom. She suddenly loved her mother for what she did. She still, in the end, loves her mother. There's a stain of the aspect of the families and her being the, technically the redheaded stepchild, <laughs> the kid that shouldn't be in the family, the stain on this family, but she loved her mother. In the end, right here, proof, she loved her mother. She was happy. Norn's seen that. Norn's seen that Aisha was holding herself back. We just talked about somebody being dead, somebody being a husk, and now you want to celebrate? I can't do that. I have to hold myself back. Everybody's upset right now. I can't be happy. No, Norn's seen it. Good on Norn. Good on Norn. She knew Aisha wanted to hug her mother and wanted to celebrate that she was safe. So good. It all suddenly made sense to Rudius. She was conflicted. Lilia was her mother. He was sure that she prayed for Paul and Zenith's well-being too, but it was Lilia's safety she prayed for above all. Now, Lilia was home safe. The situation was just too grim for her to express her joy. He thought, forgive me for doubting you, Aisha. <laughs> you do love your mom. Forgive me for saying that you don't love your mom. After Geese gave a financial report, they went to depart to the inn. Reese tried to stop them, but Geese shot back, saying that they didn't want to get in the way of their family. Talhan, Vera, and Shira agreed, and they grabbed their luggage. As they left, Reese called out to them, Everyone, thank you for all your assistance you provided my father all this time. Vera and Shira bowed their heads deep. They were with Paul since Milshin. Reese hadn't spoken to them much, but they supported them in a myriad of ways. The heroes behind the scenes. They replied, No, we should be the ones apologizing for not being able to help more. We'd appreciate it if you let us know where the captain's grave is once you have finished it. Their replies were short. Rius wondered what Paul would have been to them. They followed him to the Begaret continent, even after the rescue squad disbanded. Perhaps they had special feelings for him. Even if they loved him, it was all over now. What will you do now? Once the winter's over, we will return to Ashra Kingdom. There are other people from the search and rescue squad to whom we are indebted. I see. Well, take care. You as well, Lord Rudius. I know you will have a lot on your shoulders from here on out but take care of yourself. Bowing in, they left, disappearing in the falling snow. I wanted them to be part, <laughs> I wanted them to start guarding uh, Nanahoshi, <laughs> again, with the, the special skills and crafting scrolls. But no, this is a really good point, and I really do wish that we got more of that story, that initial meet. I mean, it's not a good story, it's not a pretty story, but it is a story. It is a story to be told. Again, like I always say, even if it is uncomfortable, I'm the type that wants the story to be told, if there's a story to be told. And yes, technically, what hints that we got from their being rescued by Paul, they were not doing well. Bandits were taking advantage of them, horribly. Paul showed up, saved them, and it seems like they dedicated their lives to him. And right here, it's even mentioned the idea that, yeah, now that Paul's gone, there was still other people that were involved in rescuing us, or there was other people that, were, that helped us with something else, and we're indebted to them. The two of them are focused on helping others that helped them, repaying their debts. So it makes sense that now that he's gone, there was still some other people involved. Let's see if we can help them too. Continuously paying it forward. They're the pinnacle example of paying it forward. We were saved. We will save others. Reese remembers something about Zenith's family helping finance Paul's activities. Zenith wasn't exactly safe and sound, but he should inform them that she had been found. He decided that he'd pin a letter to them later. Just then, Geese slapped his shoulder from behind. Well, see ya, boss. Mr. Geese, Mr. Talhan, he looked at them. Eh, what? Wipe that gloomy look off your face. What will the both of you be doing after this? We plan to head as far as Osra. We want to exchange our Begaret currency and sell these magic items too. You're going to sell them all off? Plan to keep a few for ourselves. But yeah, for the most part. The items weren't really special. One was a short sword that you can use in a place of a match. You just take the sword and like rub against a rock or something like that and just... <laughs> A little flame at the tip of it. Reese tossed most of his into the basement storage in case he needed some extra money. The magic stones were different matter. Reese wanted to research them once he had time. If he faced a similar opponent in the future, he didn't want a repeat of the labyrinth. He didn't want to be powerless. Again, this is this is literally Reese 101 here. This is what Reese does every single time. Learn from your mistakes. Learn and grow from pain. I love this aspect about Reese. Remember all the way back when he when he got his face pushed into the ground by Orsted? Immediately. What did Orsted do? 
that disturbed magic thing. How does it work? He was learning how to use it in case he ever faced him again. Not because he wanted to use disturbed magic, because he didn't feel it, he could pull it off. He wanted to learn how to counter it. Same here. I failed because of this right here that I have in my hand. I need to learn how to get past this in case it happens again. And granted, remember what uh, Roxy said, these dragons are supposed to be gone. When Millis took that big strike down and shattered the continent, they were supposed to be gone. But here they are. Still, Rudius wonders, maybe not just that, a similar opponent. I want to know how to get past this so I don't lose somebody again. If you want, we could take your items along with us to Asra. You'll get a lot more bang for your buck there than you would here, you know. And let me guess, on the way back, you'll gamble it away and make a run for it. Ah, uh, no, nah, no way. I wouldn't put my hands on your money, boss. His eyes shifting said otherwise, but Rudius did owe him an enormous debt. They wouldn't have made it through that labyrinth without him. Again, like I said earlier with Talahan giving them part of his money, every one of them played their roles. I felt like how Refugian wrote that labyrinth and everything that happened within it, everyone played their part. I'm kidding. Well, I did plan to gamble some of it. And after that, gonna continue as a venture. Those are the only skills we got. Well, we'll be here until spring. So come drink with us if you got time. You said you'd introduce me to some nice female monkey, right? <laughs> ah, I guess since you have a wife and a kid on the way, you probably don't frequent those kind of places. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does frequent the place where the monkey girl's at. That's a different place. <laughs> Geese just assumes he's talking about a brothel or something. <laughs> it was true. This wasn't the last time we're going to see each other just yet. Still, Geese was the type to just up and leave on his next adventure. Without a word, Rudis wanted to say his farewells while he could. There's so many people in this story that just disappear, <laughs> like on a moment's notice. All right, done, going to the next thing. Mr. Geese, boss, you're talking funny, you know? Talk me like you always do. Hey, newbie, why are you so particular about me calling you newbie? It's a jinx. That word alone should be inadequate, but it hit Rudius straight in the heart. If this was one of his jinx, Rudius couldn't complain. Well, either way, thank you both for everything you've done up until now. I told you, no need. Anyways, take care, boss. As Rudius bowed his head, Geese waved his hand and started walking off. He's right. You don't owe us anything. If anyone does, it'll be Paul. What I mean is, we don't need any thanks. Talhan followed behind Geese as they disappeared. I might be thinking too much into this, but I think that's really telling. If anyone owed us anything, it would be Paul. But what I mean is, we don't need any thanks. It sort of makes me believe what he's saying here is we're only returning the favor to Paul. There's no need for a repayment. Yes, it could be the idea that it's Paul that we're talking about here, not you, so you don't need to do anything. Paul would need to repay us, but he's saying specifically, what I mean is, we don't need thanks. Because we owed him something. Again, I could be overthinking it. Elanise spoke up. Men always want to show off like that. Elanise had been talking to Sylphie the whole time. Maybe about Roxy? He told her that it was his duty, but she was a busybody. <laughs> she may have had to put in a few words for him. Still, he wasn't anxious about having that conversation. So he was grateful for her consideration. Well then, I should be off to see Cliff. I don't have much time left. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. There was a side of me that's like briefly forgetting what she's talking about here. I'm like, what? What? what you leaving? Uh, no, it's... Yeah, she's rubbing her abdomen at the same time. <laughs> she's got to... She needs a deposit. Oof. Reese had put her through a lot. She had slept with three total strangers on the way back. Well, normal for her, and she laughed it off, he couldn't be so flippant. Miss Ellen Lease. You're really there for me. In more ways than you know. <laughs> she had a bitter look on her face. I'm sorry about Paul. No, that was my... Ruiz thought, my mistake, my carelessness. He wanted to say something, but then she cut him off. It was my duty in that party to make sure that something like that didn't happen. Paul died because of my shortcomings. There was no way that was true. They fought for their lives. I love this part where it's like, he's trying to defend Ellen Lace right here. Keep note here. He's trying to defend Ellen Lace right here, saying it's not her fault. But in doing so in his own mind, he is explaining to himself, it's not their fault. <laughs> and he doesn't, it's so good. They fought for their lives. None of them could have known what lay before them. Dodging the Hydra's ultimate attack and being a single head from victory. There was only two people that could blame her, Elise and Paul. Again, it's sort of like saying, we did all this stuff. There was only two people that could blame me, myself and Paul. You're doing the same thing. You're showing that everybody did what they could. And that you would only be blaming yourself because you're thinking illogically. You're not seeing the full picture. I can't blame you. Or anyone else. Then don't blame yourself either. God, she's so good. Elise is so good. <laughs> and it gets better too. Alright. Okay. Time for me to get going. 
Elise dashed out into the snow. There was someone important still waiting to hear that she had returned. Oh, Cliff boy, he gonna be so freaking happy. <laughs> Letting out a sigh, Rudy's breath turned to a visible plume. At least the displacement incident was over. At least for Rudius. All of his missing family had been found. Even if there were still victims out there missing, but he had no obligations to search for them. It was over. A long, frustrating, bitter journey. Now life could move on to the next stage. No looking back. He had to live on and look ahead. There was still so much that he had to do in this world. So much that he wanted to do. So let's look to the future. I like this. It's technically an, an interesting thing to acknowledge here. Yes, this is the... This is the end of that chapter. This whole thing was triggered by something way back here in volume two. And now we're finally, finally wrapping it up. No, I think there's still too many scars that need to be finished up here. Again, everything around Nanahoshi is still involved in that. Yes, technically every, all the scars remaining from it, like Zenith being a husk. Yes, technically those that are still mourning over Paul, including Rudius himself. There is still so much, so much to heal and so much to still wrap up, but it's, Technically, yes, it's the end of the search. After <laughs> freaking 10 volumes, it's the end of the search. It's crazy. Finally wrapping up turning point one. Technically, every one of these turning points don't really technically conclude where you think it would conclude. It's a, it's an ongoing process. It's an actual shift in his story, his life. And that continues on. It, it, there's never a wrap up for it. Roxy spoke up near him. Rudy, has everyone left already? He looked over his shoulder to Roxy. I also wanted to talk to them for a bit. It seems I'd be staying in the city for now, so that you can see them again when you have time. True. Roxy didn't step into the snow. Kind of noting the idea that all of them, the whole parties, everybody from the party has left at this point. Well, granted, not Zenith and Lilia, of course. Of the party, Roxy was the only one that hadn't left. Whether she continued to stay here or left to find a room depended on the impending conversation. Well, Roxy, yes, let's do this. He stepped back inside, Roxy's petite form falling beside him. Chapter... 15 carnage <laughs> i hate this because like i've said before i i always um copy a chapter into a document and then i break it down into notes from there now granted here recently with a lot of dialogue i don't like to break down a lot of that stuff so all of this kind of stayed but yeah whenever i'm copying sometimes i'll see the next chapter title because i have to see where the next chapter starts so i can stop there copy and paste and i see carnage and i'm like please <laughs> Let me have a breather and I see carnage and I'm thinking, oh crap, something bad. Yeah, technically bad things happen, uh, but not the, the type of bad things that I thought was going to happen. I'm thinking like blood spilling and stuff. But yeah, chapter 15, carnage. Five people remained in Rudius' living area. Sylphie, Norn, Aisha, Roxy, and Rudius. Dillo was sprawled out in front of the fireplace with a look of bliss. <laughs> Good job, Dillo. He made it. Lilia had taken Zenith to the bath after asking Rudius if he was all right. He did want to get through this discussion without her aid. Norn had lingered, despite having a rough time and sniffling. Now, I'll get into this a little bit more later on, but it is kind of an interesting to note that, yeah, technically with Zenith leaving this room, the adults have left the room. And he would kind of figure that he'd want someone of an adult figure to be there, especially with Aisha technically still being in a room and Norn. She's had experience kind of dealing with them, but he's never really liked how... Lilia handles them, so that might not be a positive. But yes, technically, Roxy is an adult. <laughs> She's like, what, nearly 50? And yes, Rudius is an adult. Yes, again, 50. <laughs> but the rest of the room is just like, yeah, technically Sylphie, Nora and Aisha, they're not technically legally adults. But that's this world, not ours. I fully acknowledge that. Norn had lingered, despite having a rough time and sniffling. Kind of wish she didn't. <laughs> kind of wish that she didn't. With her attachment to Paul, she was taking this extremely hard. Everyone took their seats, and Roxy came to Rudy's side. Seeing Sylphie's swollen belly made him hesitate, but he had a responsibility. Roxy would be in a similar state soon. If Sylphie refused him bringing her into this family, he would have to do whatever he could to support Roxy, financially or otherwise. He just blurted it out. I like to take Roxy as my second wife. While Sylphie's face was blank, Norn let out a, Huh? What are you talking about? Let me explain everything in order. He recounted Paul's death, him falling into depression. He told them how Roxy was the one to save him and that he developed feelings for her as a result. How he deeply respected her and wanted her to be part of his family. It wasn't my intention to betray Sylphie, but in the end, I did break my promise. I'm sorry. Rius got down on his knees, cold ground, placed his head on the floor. He's doing like a full Japanese, <laughs> full Japanese bow. <laughs> Sylphie panicked. Huh? Wait, Rudy. I still love Sylphie just as much as I did before, but it seems I may have gotten Roxy pregnant. 
I need to take responsibility for that. The more he spoke, the more cheaper his words, but they were his true feelings. He looked up at Sylphie who had a troubled look on her face. Perhaps confused, he couldn't blame her. He told her he loved her, swore that he would come back no matter what. Now he returned in shambles, minus family members and a hand. She may have thought that she could rejoice over his safety, but here he was wanting to take a woman into his life. Yeah, there's like multiple <laughs> facets here. I do understand the aspect of like, yeah, it's kind of a bad time to do this. Like we're still, we're still trying to talk about how we're losing somebody here. We have had loss. People are injured. Yes, we're here safe, but then we're going to start talking about this. But again, like what Rudy said, I have to get this figured out. One is because Rudy is going to sit there and just get stuck in a state of like anxiety. He needs to get it out. But at the same time, there is another aspect of here that yes, Roxy might just disappear. <laughs> he knows that she just disappears. Yes, it's also kind of nice to get everything out of the way. Let's just let's just get the, let's just rip the, all the band aids off. We have like a Paul band aid, we have a Zenith band aid, we got a Roxy. Let's pull them all off. Let's just get this over with. But no, I think that there's an aspect here that I think, I guess technically according to what I've kind of read on of obviously I've read the rest of this, there's an aspect that maybe what makes me kind of wonder that Sylphie is sort of trying to figure things out here. Like she's really trying to process everything. And it notes later on that she looked to Roxy's face, knew how she was looking at Rudius. But there is a side of me right here that yes, honestly gets really frustrated. This is the side of Sylphie that I don't like. Open your mouth. Everything starts to hit the fan. Open your mouth. She doesn't open her mouth. And yes, I do agree. There's a side of it that sort of is allowing Norn to say what she says because she doesn't want to just be disrespectful to Norn. But this is, this is you. This is your thing. This is not about Norn. This is about you and Rudius. Open your mouth. In her place, Rudius would want to lash out. Sylphie, please forgive me. Norn shrieked back at him. There's no way she can. She stomped over and grabbed his collar. How can you say that? Do you know how she felt the entire time she was waiting for you to come home? Every day, she said, I hope Rudius is okay. And I miss Rudy. And I wonder if Rudy's eating right now. Do you know how lonely she looked? How lonely she sounded the whole time? Surprised that she was even here. <laughs> okay, I have to admit, I did think about that at this point right here. I'm like, wait, Norm was actually over there? Wait, she actually went over she actually went over there and helped? It kind of indicated that one time where she actually went there because it was that that point in the week that she's supposed to come visit the house. It's like, you're not there. You're not helping. I thought about that. I did think about that. Rudius didn't know. He couldn't imagine it. Her expression, loneliness. I figured that I couldn't blame you for not being able to save father. If things were so rough, you even lost your left hand, then there was nothing anyone could do. So it seemed wrong to blame you. But now you're telling me that you had enough composure during all of that to have sex with another woman? And now you want to make her your wife? No, I wasn't composed at all. I was depressed. That's why Roxy put her own feelings on line to save me. Miss Sylphie would have done the same for you if she was there. Of course, Sylphie could. If she was there, she cured his ED after all. But Roxy was the one that actually saved him. Even though she had feelings for him, even though she knew he had someone, she resolved to do it, knowing she would be tossed aside afterwards. Norn, you should understand what it feels like. Locking yourself up in your room, feeling like you're so deep inside of your hole that you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. How are you supposed to cast aside that person that saved you from that? I think this is a... <laughs> It's kind of one of those things where it's like, Rudy's isn't wrong, but this is sort of like a cheap shot in here that's not going to help the situation. Rudy's himself has expressed this idea of people saying they understand what you're going through when they don't. And this is almost like him saying, you understand what I'm going through, pulling her into the situation. It's like, that's not really a good move right here. I personally don't think this is a good move right here. Um, it's trying to make her understand what he was going through there. I understand that. But they're completely different situations. This is not the same story. It's literally like saying, well, I saved you from a dark room, so would you discard me? Equating that to Roxy pulling him out of a state of depression by betting him. It's not the, it, you can't equate that. You're talking about marriage here versus just accepting as a brother. She replied, I know, I'm grateful to you for helping me through that, but this is totally a separate matter. Lord Millis would never permit someone taking a second wife. I don't think she's this devoted. It's like one of those aspects of, yeah, I technically with what happened with Cliff's chapter and Norn's chapter, I think she sort of accepted something there. Like she got a little bit more religious there. But this is kind of one of those moments where you kind of wonder, are you using this now? Like, are you using that book to now for your own benefit? 
Like, do you normally care what that book says or are you just using it now because it fits the situation? She never liked the idea of Rudius getting with somebody else. Again, way back here, she thought that he was with Edis. And the moment that she seen him with Sylphie, she got mad at him. The book meant nothing to you. I think it sort of plants this mindset in her mind, but I've always felt she's against this concept because of Lilia, because of Aisha, because of these two, I've never had a happy life. And so I don't want you to do what father did. Even though she loves father and father could never do anything wrong, she didn't like the sight of it. And I think that sort of fueled her mindset on the idea of somebody loving more than one person. It creates this problem for the children. And I'm curious if eventually they'll get in that. That's right. She was a follower of Millis. But no, he figured that wasn't the issue. Maybe it was just him. Maybe he was doing something wrong and he was trying to strong arm his way into it being right. Yes, it's it's called excuses. I mean, you are you are developing excuses here, but at least you're acknowledging that you're wrong for what you did. You're apologizing. You're not saying, no, I had to have her fix me and I'm not going to apologize. That would be a different case. But he's acknowledging it was wrong, but he still loves her and he needed her at that time. He is spelling out the situation properly. But yes, he is sort of kind of, because he's trying to retaliate with what Norn is saying, he's falling himself down this road where he's making excuses. And it, it, it's, he's on the defensive and it's always going to keep going downhill from that point. Which again is why I wanted Sylphie to speak up. <laughs> Come on, Sylphie, help me, girl. Now it goes downhill from here. Now, now Norn is going into my bad bag right now. Like, here's the bad characters. Norn is, is about to fall into it. Besides, why this tiny girl? She's not any different from me. Norn glared at Roxy. Roxy returned her gaze with her usual poker face. She was taller than Norn, but barely so. In the face of Norn's hostile gazes, she remained unfazed and muttered, I may be small, but I'm still an adult. <laughs> Technically, yes. Physically, in this room, she is the only adult in this room. <laughs> She's literally the only adult in this room. Her voice trembled, an open door to her heart, but her words were such that they could be construed as impertinent. Infuriated, Norn shot back. If you're such an adult, don't you feel like you're being shameless? Don't you feel bad for barging in on somebody's relationship? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see this adapted. Oh, no, I don't want to see the later parts of it, though, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cry for Roxy walking away. Reese objected with a firm voice. Norn, that's going too far. I'm the one that said I wanted to bring her into our family. Roxy's done nothing wrong. She's the one that tried to back out of it. Norn kept her eyes on Roxy. You stay quiet. Okay, this, this is the part where it gets really difficult not to stand up. <laughs> Besides, if she really tried to back out, then why is she still here, clinging to you? She's just taking advantage of your offer. Rius honestly thought about slapping her, but knew he didn't have a right to do such a thing. If he slapped her, he'd feel like he really would be a complete scum. That's a struggle because it, she's literally, there is a point now where Norn is at, I think that she is completely on the line. But like, how do you really resolve that situation? Again, you kind of let it build up and the further it gets into it, the more the heated it gets, it's at some point where you just can't hold it. Like you've let it, you've let the cat out of the bag. Things are becoming really rough in this conversation. Roxy remained quiet, looking indifferent as usual. Her eyes turned to the floor, then finally lifted up, bowing to Norn. You're right. It is shameless of me. I apologize. I think right here she knew she was destroying something. I really do think like right here, Roxy's realizing I'm, this isn't going well. Sylphie's over here saying nothing like Sylphie always does because Sylphie doesn't open her mouth, which makes me really surprised here in a minute how much she talks, but Sylphie's not doing anything. She's not saying anything. And we find out, yes, a part of that is because she's allowing Norn to speak her mind. She's allowing Norn to have a voice. But then, yes, technically, Rudius is now having problems with his sister. This is going to create a rift between these two. I need to get out of here. I'm not, this isn't going to work. I am causing a problem. But I also think there's a side of that Roxy doesn't like to be in this kind of conflict. This is very uncomfortable for her. Just step away from it. This isn't going to work. Standing up straight, Roxy drifted to the edge of the room, grabbed her luggage, placed her hat on her head, and moved towards the exit. Rudis couldn't even stop her. He knew that they would face resistance. Knew not to underestimate how difficult it would be for everyone to accept this. But he thought he could convince them. That was naive. Now here we were. 
<laughs> Roxy had been lamb blasted for her part. She probably just felt like she was walking on a bed of nails and that things might be painful if she stayed. No one would choose to stay with that possibility in mind. Even Rudius felt he would run to the door, unable to withstand it. Yeah, I think if Rudius was in this situation, he'd be out of there. Rudius could not take this kind of, this kind of heat. This kind of heat really does trouble him. And he would be probably the first one to head the door. But there's a side of me that right here where I'm like, this really does hurt me. And I understand it. Don't get me wrong. I understand this is Rudius. This has always been his weakness. But it's still an aspect of, Rudius, get off of your butt and go to that door. Man up, stand up, fix the situation. Don't just sit there. Literally, if somebody else right here doesn't speak up, Roxy would have been gone. He would have lost her. He didn't speak up. This is what you wanted. This was your mistake. You wanted to fix this. This was your resolve. And you said nothing. But Rudius couldn't let her leave with such a bitter taste. That wasn't how he wanted this to end. He wanted to repay her for everything that she had done. Not just bring her in here and have her drag the mud. He wanted to make her happy. Yet he couldn't stop her. Yes, you can. <laughs> just stand up and open your mouth. He couldn't hold her back. Maybe he couldn't make her happy. If this is resolved, I'm starting to wonder, Rudius. He had to think. She'd be leaving any second now. He had to at least stop her. Even if it meant slapping Norn. Even if it meant making Norn hate him. I think eventually she would get over it, but no, I, I, the, the slapping part is just, I don't think this is necessarily a part where that's needed, but at the same time, it's rough. But yeah, Sylphie, uh, in case you all forgot, Sylphie was in the room. She was over here. <laughs> she spoke up. Wait, Miss Roxy, please wait. She went to Roxy's side and grabbed her hand. Roxy's face turned with tears welling up. Norn gasped, why are you stopping her? Just let her go. <laughs> Sylphie replied, Norn, could you please be quiet? <laughs> and it's so funny because I think Sylphie's the only one that could probably have made Norn shut up right here. That's the funny thing. It's like, Rudius, if Rudius spoke up and said, Norn, can you please be quiet? Norn would be like, excuse me? No, I'm not going to be quiet. But now Sylphie turns and says, uh, can you be quiet? And, Sylph and Norn's like, yeah. <laughs> I think it's like a partial shock factor. But again, it's it's partly to do with the fact that Norn does know this affects Sylphie. I do acknowledge that Norn does understand how much this is going to affect somebody that she's been watching, standing around for the past few months, waiting for Reese to come home. But I don't think that's what's making her angry right now. She's mad at Rudius. But there's still an aspect of here that acknowledges that Sylphie is the biggest impacted by this situation. So if she's saying, be quiet, I guess I gotta shut up. So yes, I was really happy that Sylphie said that. Norn, could you please be quiet? <laughs> Sylphie just like turns and says, Norn, could you please be quiet? I, I want the anime to just, to just put an Udasai in there, even though that's way too rough of a way of putting it. Just Udasai. <laughs> You're too noisy. Dumbfounded, Norn squeaked a huh? <laughs> you are being far too harsh this whole time. I never expressed any objections. Norn froze at a loss for words. Please sit. Sylphie turned her back on Norn and guided Roxy to the sofa. The two sat down. Gosh, thank you, Sylphie, for finally opening her mouth. <laughs> finally! But now there's an explanation for Sylphie. Sylphie explains why she just sat there the whole time, not saying a thing. I was a little confused at first. So it seems like you're the one who saved Rudy, Miss Roxy. Roxy tentatively nodded. Yes, but I do have an ulterior motive and I don't intend to make any excuses for that. But yeah, Sylphie acknowledged that Rudy was really handsome. She wouldn't have believed Roxy if she didn't explain that she had alternative motives. Like, if you said that you didn't, I believe you lying because boy good looking. Now, this was the biggest, this was the funniest line out of this whole thing. Oh, I laughed so loud when I read this. Sylphie followed up with, I think if I had been in your place, I would have done the exact same thing. <laughs> so if anybody hates Roxy for what she did, just know that Sylphie would have done the same exact thing. Meaning that if Rudius was married with Roxy, Rudius was down there and was literally dying of depression, locked up in his room, not eating anything, and he's not going to make it home alive, Sylphie would have went in there and done the same exact thing. Massive... Massive credit to Sylphie for being willing to admit this. 
both because it eases the mind of Roxy, which we'll find out in a minute. She fully understands Roxy. Just by looking at Roxy, she acknowledged this girl is in love. This girl wanted to save my husband. And this girl did what she needed to do to save him. Not girl, technically. It's a, it's a lady. <laughs> She's an adult. But still, that's a hard thing to admit. And I fully acknowledge there's an aspect here that it is to ease Roxy's mind. She thinks she did something terrible here. And I want her to know it's okay. I would have done the same. Massive credits to her. Sylphie smiled with a gentle expression. Roxy was stiff in contrast. To be honest, I figured it would be a matter of time. Um, what's a matter of time? Roxy asked. Rudy bringing another woman home. Rudy has thought, wait, she didn't actually trust me? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I would think Sylphie would be completely mindless if she thought that she could trust you. <laughs> You know Rudy is a pervert, right? I figured he would do it with someone if I wasn't around, but he's loyal. So I figured if he did it with someone else, he would bring her into our family, just like he did with me. I didn't figure I'd be able to have him all to myself forever. There's like two aspects here. One is like a big stomach punch to Rudius, which again, nobody's oblivious to Rudius. But there's another aspect here that I do appreciate that her mindset here is that he's not just gonna go around sleeping with people. That he trusts her enough that he'd be at least willing to say, I did this, Sylphie. He'd be truthful to her and he would take responsibility. Because of what he did back here, he said, I would take responsibility for her. I would not discard Sylphie to the side just because finally my ED's fixed. I got to do it. Now discard her. Ariel was pushing him about that. What are you going to do? I'll take responsibility. She knew based on that conversation, he'd do the same thing if he went off and slept with somebody else. Which yes, again, I acknowledge he wasn't going to do until Ellen Lace said she was preggers. <laughs> Rudius wanted to protest, but she did hit the bullseye. He had no right to say anything. She continued, Honestly, I figured if he was going to bring anyone home, it would be Linia, Persena, or Miss Nanahoshi. Roxy replied, I've not heard those names, except for Miss Nanahoshi. They're his friends at school. They're all very sexy, with huge breasts. Rudius protested in his mind that Nanahoshi wasn't exactly <laughs> sexy. That's so mean. Poor Banana. <laughs> Rudius throwing shade at Banana. She's cute. But yeah, she doesn't have like large ones like Lenny and Persena. <laughs> Truthfully, what I heard about your trip was brutal. And then there's Paul's death as well. I completely forgot about the possibility that he might have hooked up with someone else. That's why I was also surprised when I heard. But it does make sense. What does? Ever since you got here, you've been staring at him with an anxious look on your face. I wonder what that was all about. At first, I thought it was because you were nervous about him announcing Paul's death. But this is what it was actually all about. You had the eyes of a woman in love, Miss Roxy. When Roxy heard this, her face heated up and she replied, I'm sorry for making you witness something so unpleasant. Roxy lowered her head, cheeks red. It wasn't unpleasant. How should I put this? You know, Rudy always talked about you, Miss Roxy. What did he say? Things like, she's the only magician I respect. He talked the same way about you before the displacement incident as well. Roxy replied, I'm not sure what to say, but I feel bad that you had to hear that. <laughs> There's like a two aspect of like, I think she kind of acknowledged the idea that here Rudius is talking about another woman all the time to his wife. But there's another aspect again that Roxy thinks that Rudius is over talking her. Again, not acknowledging that Rudius is over talking her for reasons that she doesn't realize. He had massive, massive respect for her. This was his goddess. Not that she taught him how to throw water bottles and that he's better at it than her now. Sylphie said, well, that's why I did feel a bit jealous as well. He had such an admiration in his eyes every time he talked about you. I thought to myself, this Roxy McGurdia person is such an incredible magician. There's no way I could ever stand shoulder to shoulder with her. That sucks. Honestly, that hurts. Again, I kind of mentioned that a minute ago is this idea of almost feeling insignificant to the one that you love because they have such admiration for this other person. It was sort of what we talked about when, when Sylphie said that she didn't like him talking about Rajard. That's literally an aspect of her feeling like the one she loves that she wants all to herself is not all to herself. It is an element of selfishness, but in love, you have that. You want that person's all, and if they keep talking about somebody else and not your doings, it hurts. But now that I've actually seen you and know that you're just a normal girl who loves Rudy, that jealousy is gone. That means you're just the same as me. Sylphie lifted Roxy's hat away and caressed her face. Nora may have expressed her opposition, but I welcome you. There you go, boys. <laughs> Harem has been approved. Sylphie has approved the harem to shock to nobody. To shock to nobody. 
Bulbasaur is fine with the harem of the starter Pokemons. Bulbasaur was my Pokemon, by the way. <laughs> that was my starter Pokemon. I think there's an element of taking away that sort of pedestal that's been placed on. Again, Rhys always puts people on pedestals. And people put him on pedestals. So it's it's a <laughs> it's a thing that works both ways here. But Rhys has always put Roxy on this pedestal while talking to Sylphie. So it does make sense that she'd feel this uneasiness about her suddenly being in the house and he's talking about this. But then she's seen Roxy, looked at her, and said, this is a normal girl. She's anxious. She's looking at him. She's in love. She's a normal person. She's not some deity in the room. She's a normal girl, just like me. Roxy was surprised and Rius's jaw dropped. He never dreamed Sylphie would accept it so easily. You don't know. <laughs> this is one of those aspects where everybody knew this was going to be okay. Except for her stinking husband. <laughs> we all know she was going to be okay with this. Rius, you don't know your own wife. Sylphie, Miss, just Sylphie's fine. I hope we can get along. Um, rocks? Oh my gosh, dude. I know that's a bad translation, but please don't ever say that name ever again. I never want to hear rocks ever again. <laughs> What a stupid name. She was probably just saying Roxy in a more formal way in Japanese. Like instead of having like Senpai or San or whatever, they'll change that. And translators usually change that by just going, oh, well, I'll just shorten into a nickname. That's the way to make it more, uh, less formal and more personal. And it sounds stupid every time they do it. Roxy replied, um, I'm actually 50 years old as of this year. So that kind of nickname sounds a bit too childish. Oh, oh, right. You're older than me. <laughs> then sorry about that. Now that I think about it, Rui did mention that, but seeing you, it just didn't register. Well, I am petite. I'm not too big myself. They held hands and laughed. Well, Roxy, let's support Rui together then. Thank you, Sylphie. A nice ending. Yay. <laughs> Even though it got really heated with Norn. They shook hands, radiating a sort of solidarity. Rudius was able to let out a sigh of relief. A reaction that slipped out the moment he thought it would be okay. Norn glanced at him, furrowing her brows. It's not over yet. <laughs> If Miss Sylphie is accepting it, then I have nothing to say. Which makes me wish she spoke up earlier. Apparently, Norn wasn't quite on board yet. She frowned slightly, glaring at them. Perhaps he had earned her contempt once again. Sylphie pacified her by remarking, Forgive him, Norn. Rudy is not a follower of Millis. But Mr. Paul had two wives as well. Did he not? True, he did. Would you say the same kind of things to Miss Lilia then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think she would. Ugh. Norn went wide-eyed, looking to Aisha, who was beside her. Aisha, being quiet the whole time, <laughs> had the picture of composure. <laughs> the moment I read this, I'm like, because she like, I'm next. <laughs> I think Aisha loves this whole situation, <laughs> which technically is sort of hinted at in a minute. Aisha's, Aisha's good with this. Aisha good with this. The door has been open for Aisha and she is perfectly fine with the situation. Norm replied, Oh, I'm sorry, Aisha. It's fine, really. I know you often say things without thinking them through. Why do you have to put it like that? Look what happened. That wasn't your place to speak. You kept going on about Miss Sylphie and her feelings. But really, you were just forcing your own beliefs on everyone. What? Norm popped up on her feet. Aisha, you went too far. But I understand what Norn is saying, too. If Sylphie had said the same things herself, it would have been understandable. I'm equally at fault for not considering how everyone would feel. I can't blame Norn. Well, I guess if you say so. Norn looked conflicted, seemingly uncomfortable. She then went to march off. However, she stopped, looking back to Rudius. Um, big brother, what is it? Would you teach me swordsmanship when you have the time? Rudius was shocked by this. He assumed that she was going to turn around and start berating him again. Was she wanting to use Paul's sword? Well, he felt like it was a half-baked attempt at self-defense that would be destructive at best. This world wasn't like his last. Even a little power was better than none. The bigger problem was that, was he going to be a good teacher? Are you sure you want me to teach you? I can't approve of what you've done, but I don't hate you either. Okay. That wasn't what he was asking. <laughs> He's like, you want me to teach you? Like, I'm not a good teacher. And she's like, well, I'm not mad at you. <laughs> it's like, that's not what I'm asking. <laughs> All right. I'll take time to teach you after school or something. Please do. She then left to her room. It's kind of a nice thing. Like, at least there's a, a nice light at the end of the tunnel. I think she was already planning on asking him to teach her how to do swordsman because she now has father's sword, which that kind of opens the door. My big question mark was I was wondering... What is she going to end up doing that's going to make herself stronger? Like, I knew she wanted to get stronger, but is she going to be a healer? Is she going to be a mage? Is she going to be a swords fighter? Apparently, it's a swords fighter. Or at least 
that on top of something else. And I think this is that inspiration, getting her father's sword. But again, it's nice to see, at least at the end of this whole argument, she doesn't hate his guts. He hasn't reset their relationship. She's still okay with him. So that's a good thing. But yeah, kind of props to Aisha here for kind of pointing out the obvious here. You just spoke without thinking. Like, you injected yourself into a discussion that you should not have been in. Yes, later on, get with Rudius and say, I don't like this. But right now, the two people that this is important to, honestly, is Rudius, Sylphie, Roxy. Not you. Let them hash it out and then express your issue. But speaking on Sylphie's behalf, that was wrong. In the end, Rudius was helpless. Sylphie had to rescue him with her generosity. Aisha spoke up. Big brother, you look really pathetic right now, you know? He just nodded, unable to say anything in defense. <laughs> Again, Aisha dropped in truth bombs. After that, Rudius, Sylphie, and Roxy began talking about how they would handle things going forward. The order in which they'd be spending nights together, negotiating quality time. Amidst this, Aisha took her leave. Well, Miss Roxy, I look forward to living together. Yes, me too. Aisha grumbled on her breath as she left, but she was smiling. Rudius wondered what was up with her. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the grumbling part. She mad somebody beat her to it. <laughs> she doesn't like that Roxy beat her to it. She's grumbling. Gosh, dang it. I wanted to be the next one up. But she's smiling again, like I said earlier, because I think she's like, at least Roxy opened the door. I wasn't sure how I was going to get in there. He does. He kept shooting me down. But now that that door is open... We're no longer going to have the excuse that I am faithful to Sylphie. No, Rudy has opened that door. And she's like, it's time for me. <laughs> That's totally the conclusion I'm drawing here. As their conversation continued, Rudy realized that most would be aghast. That they were discussing this amidst Paul's passing. But that was precisely why he wanted a more cheerful topic. I like this. It is acknowledging that, yeah, this is probably not something we should be talking about after we just got done talking about a death and Norn crying, and everybody feeling just destroyed. But he wants something cheerful for once. He needs something to up his emotions. He needs positivity. It's okay. I, 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 we talk about this a lot when our personal family, whenever we get together, we're talking about something heavy or something really bad happened. At some point, we like to sort of make light of the situation in certain ways that aren't disrespectful, just because we know it's good to be positive. While Roxy offered Sylphie to be Rudeus' main priority, opting to accept him on his free time, Sylphie protested. She wanted it to be fair. Sylphie figured they would eventually take in more wives, so she didn't want them to be bashful. Props. <laughs> that's good stuff. <laughs> that's a good thing there. And I think that's, this is very consistent with these characters. Sylphie's going to be more open, and Roxy's going to be a lot more, I guess, not, selfless isn't the word, but just kind of, don't make me the priority. I'm not that important. I think that's really the best way to put it. But again, she still feels bad. She still feels guilty. Rudy's thought how little faith Sylphie had in him and his lower half. <laughs> like, again, yes, they know you. Welcome, welcome to reality. They know who you are, Rudius. Roxy's issue is that she still felt overwhelmed with guilt. She wanted to stay on the side until Sylphie had her baby. They came to agreement that they would wait one month for the birth to happen, before he would take Roxy in officially as his wife. He was probably an awful person for finding disappointment and not having lovemaking for an entire month. But thinking about having both of them made his little boy stand up. <laughs> yes, you're gonna have yourself a threesome eventually, probably. I'm um, Rudy. If you absolutely can't wait, let me know, okay? We'll do something about it. Oh, no, I'll take care of myself. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. No matter how bad he was, he wasn't gonna cheat more than he already had. Sure. He wanted Sylphie to trust... <laughs> He wouldn't falter again. Sure. Last time was a unique situation. And because it was Roxy. As long as he didn't wind up in a depressive spiral and a woman of Roxy's caliber didn't appear with him, he wouldn't cheat again. Ever. So apparently Rudy is going to get into a really difficult situation and Edis is going to show up. <laughs> oh, but you said Roxy is pregnant as well, right? If we wait a month, you won't be able to have sex with her either. What do we do then? <laughs> And then Roxy spoke up. Um, about what Rudy said regarding that, I think he was lying. I didn't get an opportunity to say as much, but I'm not actually pregnant. <laughs> oh, man. Huh? Rudy is blurted out. <laughs> what was Elise talking about before? Oh. <laughs> 
She baited him right into a trap. That jerk. Damn it. Dancing right in the palm of her hand. Yep. Elise goaded you. <laughs> Elise is goat. Like, she is greatest of all time. I love it. The reason why I like this, because I think it's terrible. This is actually extremely terrible if you think about it. The idea of telling somebody, you got somebody pregnant, go marry them. And then you like going in there with that falsity. But what did I say earlier? I thought it was really trashy that Rudius didn't want to take responsibility until he found out that she was pregnant. Annalise knew that she had to trick him and say that to push him forward, to accept that he does love her. Because in the end, when he's proposing this to Sylphie, it's not he's saying, I got her pregnant, I need to marry her. That wasn't it. Sylphie heard from Rudius that he loved her. Sylphie seen from Roxy that she loved him. That was what was important. And Elise just said that to push him forward. Get you in there in that room. Talk about it. You'll see. So it's terrible, but it's not in the end. <laughs> Roxy asked, what is it, Rudy? Nothing, but let me just clear the air and say I wasn't lying. It was just a misunderstanding on my part. <laughs> She's not going to say, um, yeah, Sylphie, um, your grandma told me. <laughs> he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to mess with them with that. Oh, all right then. She scratched her cheek, face red. But I look forward to it someday. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. <laughs> I wonder what our pervy Rudy is going to do to me, Roxy wondered aloud. <laughs> and that was how he came to have a second wife. That, like I said, it was that was a, a rough start, but I think it kind of ended really well. Um, like I said, no surprise to anybody, Sylphie was accepting of it. But it, at least it put from Sylphie's own words how much she's seen there. I really do like hearing from her, I've seen something, I've heard things, I've, Ru Rudy keeps talking about you, I know how wonderful you are, now I see you're a normal person, I see how much you love each other, and I was expecting this eventually. She already had her heart set, this is coming. It's never, it, this is an eventuality, unfortunately. He is going to bring somebody else in, he is a pervert. She has always seen him with that pervy face. She knows who Rudy is from the first day he met her. Yes, technically pulling down her pants and all that other stuff. She knows he's a pervert. Knows that he's not gonna keep himself in check. She's just happy she's with him. She's just happy that she has this much of him. Yes, it hurts that he broke his promise, but that's besides the point that she knows this is him. That night, Rudius and Sylphie lay together. They gazed at each other quietly. Sylphie then spoke up. I had something absolutely tragic pictured in my mind when you said you had something else to talk about and Roxy was standing beside you. What's that? I thought you might tell me that you couldn't love me anymore and that you wanted to leave me. I would never say that. He wondered what kind of sleazeball would say that. <laughs> One that cheated on their life? <laughs> yeah, I know. Sylphie rustled around and he could feel her caressing the stump of his missing hand. But I was still anxious. I don't know why. I just had a feeling that you weren't going to come back to me. A sense of foreboding? He could see that. I mean, it was a close call. It wouldn't be a surprise if he had died. Did I worry you? Yes, it's okay now. As he brushed her head, he noticed her hair was longer. She had grown it out long for him. She was waiting for him the whole time, but he did something stupid. That thought had him apologizing for breaking his promise. It's fine. I love you the way you are. But if you'd done the same thing, I would have screamed and cried like a baby that lashed out at you for betraying me. I know I would, but I wouldn't do that to you. I don't have eyes for anyone else but you, Rudy. Another gut punch for Rudy. <laughs> she pecked him on the cheek as a wave of affection bubbled up inside of his chest. He would love her for the rest of his life. She must have been worried and wanted to wail at him. Still, she accepted everything without complaint. Then he felt something wriggling against his lower abdomen. Come on, Sylphie, we can't do that. If you start touching me down there, I'm not gonna be able to hold off. I mean, I'm interested in pregnant sex, but... <laughs> Gosh, Rudy, <laughs> seriously, dude. No, we can't, Rudy. <laughs> it wouldn't be good for the baby. Huh? <laughs> They looked down to a mountainous lump. Folding back the blanket, they discovered, Dillo? <laughs> what did you get in here? The pervy little thing sticking its head in people's crotches. Just like you, Rudy. <laughs> no, I... Oh, well, I guess you can sleep with us for the night. He's not gonna... He's not gonna... <laughs> he's not even gonna protest that statement. Eventually, they would have to make a kennel. Or perhaps it could be housebroken like a dog. Then they retired for the night. Sylphie, glad, Rudius was home. And that is chapter 15. I need to decide if I'm going to keep going because 
Ah, this next chapter's long. I, let me think. It's not that the next chapter is long. It's just, <laughs> it's a short chapter. It's just extremely emotional for me. So let's see. Let's see where things go. I already told people on Discord I might just do like a part one and then a part two or something, but we shall see. We shall see. Chapter 16, Before His Grave. A few days had passed and a fear of another disaster striking gradually faded. The future seemed brighter than that, even if he had concerns about Zenith. She ended up claiming one of the larger bedrooms. It was the one that the previous owner <laughs> had been killed in. And Rudy just told Lilia it probably not best for her to stay in there, but Zenith was just kind of constantly in there. So Lilia was like, yeah, don't worry about it. Rudy had also taken Zenith to a doctor, Renoa Keenum's most prominent practitioners, referred to them by Ariel. Unfortunately, he threw his hands up saying he had no idea what kind of issue she had. There was just no technology in this world for it. Perhaps it was because of healing magic that medical treatment in this world was so unbalanced. Yeah, I can see that. If all you had to do is have somebody come up and touch you and say heal, you know, it kind of takes away the requirement for people to study ways to help. Think of just the simple aspect of somebody having a large cut. I mean, back in the day, they probably just covered it up with a leaf or something like that. Then over time, they learned ways to be able to mend it and mend it in a way that it wouldn't leave a scar behind. And yes, ways that would prevent infections and all that other kind of stuff. That was due to the fact that we didn't have healing in this world. But this world has it, so why study it? Why experiment on this stuff? I would argue that because there is a lack of things around the mind, you would think at least in the world of the mind, they would be doing research. You would have some king at some point, and this is, this is true back in this type of setting. You would have a king at some point would have an issue, and that would push the scholars within this kingdom to figure out a way to remedy it. That was typically how things were progressed back in those days. Regardless, they drew up plans for the rehabilitation, specifically one formatted for someone with amnesia. While uncertain it would work, it was probably better than doing nothing. He also had plans to search for a magical implement that could help recover memories. Not that he knew that one existed, which I didn't really think about that. I mean, technically with <laughs> what's happening with uh, Cliff right now, he's making a magical implement to help Unleash. Why not make one for the mind as well? Something that could I don't know, deliver mana up there that could help restore things. Get things sparking again, possibly? It would probably be a long-term endeavor. And he wasn't sure what her family would say about the situation. I really am curious what they'll end up coming back with. I think there's one side of me that kind of believes that, I don't know, I haven't seen anything positive about this family. <laughs> I have not seen anything positive about Zena's family. Yes, she was a child and she was revolting. That's why she left the family. But you can assume there was something, some aspect there that was partly her parents' fault. But then everything that happened around Paul... Aisha, all that stuff, just added fuel to the fire. And yes, technically Norn. I think this family is so caught up in their pride and everything, I think they might just discard Zenith. She's a lost cause. She will bring shame to our family because she's so broken. And the reason why she's there is because she left us for that Paul guy. And then she got caught up in that disaster. I really do have a feeling they're going to just completely cut her off. And I hate the idea of that. Sylvie was progressing on schedule. He had his way with her swollen chest, though, he had to be gentle, otherwise she'd get angry. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit more tender. Pregnancy brought about changes to the body, and he had joy knowing that he brought about that change. <laughs> That's probably what people meant when they talked about the sense of domination. Ah, Sylphie is all mine, he thought. <laughs> That's do weird. Do weird. Having no left hand sucked, though, because it was half the satisfaction. <laughs> but with her chest producing milk soon, I'm just gonna skip this part. <laughs> I don't get this. I really don't. This is one of those things I just don't know. I don't get it. With her producing milk soon, he wanted to know if he could have a taste, but he wasn't sure if he would ask. She might end up scorning him, but it might be worth asking, even if the odds were against him. <laughs> you should... She said, you sure do love my breasts. Yes, I do. They're tiny, but they're the best in the world. Best in the world? Can you really say that after you groped Roxy's? Forgive me for my sins. <laughs> I'm not angry. She's just teasing you, dude. They engaged in playful banter, their relationship as strong as ever. In his previous world, this incident would probably have strained their relationship. But in this world, Sylphie was understanding. As long as he loved them equally, he could have two or three wives. He's already flagging it at this point. He's already getting the readers prepared. He's like, all right, we're gonna get Edison here eventually. So let's start, let's start having him say three. Yeah, he's, he's already setting up for Edis. I mean, it could be somebody else. But it's gonna be at her. It's gonna be at us. I don't know. It could be an. I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt Refugian at this point could be just fooling the reader into thinking, oh yeah, it's inevitability, and they just not do it. But it is interesting him kind of noting here that yes, in my previous world, something like this would be kind of frowned upon. Specifically Japan. I mean, there are places in this world that accepts that, but specifically in Japan, not so much accepted. 
And he's feeling like, well, if we were there, it, this would probably ruin things. But here, Sylphie accepts it. I think it's just more of a general aspect of Sylphie and this world, not necessarily one or the other. Roxy took up one of the smaller rooms on the second floor. He wanted her to have a more spacious one, but apparently she liked cramped spaces. <laughs> Trauma from the, the teleportation labyrinth, which he understood. He didn't mind them either. Well, technically, yes, because he was shut in at some point in a nice small Japanese room. Roxy became a professor at the university. He spent time introducing her to everyone and announced his return. But he'll save that story for another time. Note right here, because I have a funny joke later on. <laughs> As a story for another time. So apparently in, I don't know, volume 13, we're going to have this segment where he brings in and says hi to everybody and introduces Roxy. Another month passed and Sylphie gave birth. It was a normal delivery, no complications. The only issue was the blizzard, which made the doctor unable to arrive on time. Thankfully, they had Lilia. I'm not surprised they even got a doctor if they had Lilia there, but it could be an aspect that maybe they were a little bit concerned the idea that this is an elf, not technically something that Lilia has helped with. I mean, Lilia could have before becoming part of Paul's family, but I don't think so. Nothing has indicated that. Lilia was experienced and had Aisha for assistance, walking her through everything. Rudius and Roxy were on standby with healing, but Rudius' nerves were shot. All they could do was grip Sylphie's hand as she contorted in pain. Lilia said that it brought back memories for when Zenith gave birth to Norn. This gave Rudius flashbacks, Norn being a breech baby. Both in danger, Paul was useless and completely choked up, but Rudius kept his cool and assisted back then. Lily consoled him, saying that Sylphie would be fine, briskly working away and handling everything with such practice expertise. But he couldn't calm his nerves. He clung to her hand and wiped away the sweat from her brow. Sylphie giggled, despite in pain, telling him to relax. <laughs> As like, it's so the case sometimes, the, the women in these situations are a lot more stronger than the men. <laughs> we suck. <laughs> Even Aisha snorted, earning a smack from Lilia. As things began, Rudius wondered what he could do, but he couldn't do anything. Soon after, the baby was born. She let out a cry as she was delivered safely into this world. A little girl, adorable, with the same color hair as Rudius. Lila lifted her up and handed her to Sylphie. Holding her tight, she sighed with relief. I hate this and I didn't even think about this. It sucks that this has to be a thought process here. Ugh. Oh. It hurts. I know that it's not meaning negative. It's just one of those aspects that you do hope for the best for your children. And anything that could possibly give a sign that they're going to have problems is obviously a painful thing. You want a perfect birth. You want perfection to happen. And you want that child to have no issues in their life. But there was one thing that apparently was weighing on Sylphie's mind this entire time. Will I essentially, not physically, I don't know yet, curse this child? I'm glad. I'm so glad. Her hair is not green. <sighs> Rudius messed with Sylphie's hair. Hair that once was green, but was now a beautiful white. Yeah. Even if their baby had green hair, he wouldn't have blamed Sylphie. How could he? Green was his favorite color in this world. The color of Sylphie's hair. The color of Rajard's hair. And yes, in a certain light, Roxy's as well shined an emerald color. He loved green. <laughs> it's like the thing that is taboo and hated by this world, Rudius loves. He's always been with. He's always had the best memories with the color green. Rudius thought if someone wanted to discriminate against their green hair, they would have to go through him. He'd face them, even making himself an enemy of the world. Green hair was an ill omen of this world. He thanked God for their good fortune, and his child had his hair color. Again, that sucks. <laughs> I. It's nice that he's, again, it's nice that they're acknowledging that this is something that's going to make the child's life difficult. They won't discriminate, but they know others will. That's the painful part of this whole situation. And again, it just sucks that that is something that's on their mind when this whole thing's happening. I hope they don't have the same hair color as me. I don't want them to have the life I had. It sucks. It really does suck. And that's technically something that was happening with Rudius with Rajard. He was taking on the world for the sake of Rajard. But yes, he thanked God for this. <laughs> so he says, I wanted to make the joke, but he makes it himself. Speaking of God, <laughs> she was in the next room, pale as a sheet, gripping her staff. Rudius took his child to his hands. She was warm, voice fierce as she cried. She was tiny and overflowing with life. His heart flooded with emotion when he thought about how this girl was his. His baby that Sylphie had given birth to. Tears sprung up. Paul was gone, but now they had a baby. Paul had saved his life. If he hadn't been there for him, Rudius wouldn't be holding this child. However, in exchange, Paul would never hold his wife, his own daughters, or his grandchild. That was like one of the worst, um, that was one of the worst 
flaggings was that whole scene just before they went back down the labyrinth where Rudius was with Lilia and Paul in that room alone was that aspect of him looking forward to holding that grandchild. He was so happy, so excited for that grandchild. It was like, yes, it, we're, you get it. <laughs> we get it at this point. Would Paul be bitter that he couldn't be here? Or laughed and boast that it was all thanks to him? <laughs> I think right now he would be. Either way, Rudius had to keep living for the sake of his child. He couldn't die. He had to protect Sylphie, his family. Sylphie ended up taking the first two letters of their names, altered them, and come up with the name Lucy Grey Rat. Aisha laughed, calling it a cheap name. <laughs> and Lilia smacked her over the head again. <laughs> that routine is never getting old. It's kind of like the whole Lenny and Persina thing whenever Persina tricks Lenny into agreeing with something that's bad for her. It's the same thing with Lilia and Aisha. But it shows that they're still family. I like it. Rius was just happy that it was a girl. If he had a boy, he might end up calling him Paul. Which I think would be cool. I, I think that's a really cool idea. Um, just this aspect of allowing something that you've lost to sort of live on. But it also could sort of bring... It's one of those mixed bags of like, every time you go to call for your son, you're going to think of your father who's gone. But at the same time, it is that idea of feeling that comfort that it's almost as if they're living on. And that technically Paul reincarnated as your baby. <laughs> I don't know. My, maybe Paul reincarnated as Lucy. <laughs> Later on, he ends up telling Rudius, Hey, it's Paul. <laughs> don't say anything, chat. Lilia then chased Rudius out of the room. Apparently, they're having much to be done. In the living room, he planted himself on the sofa. Roxy settled next to him. Looking weary herself, probably mentally fatigued. That was the first time watching a person give birth. It was amazing. I've seen a couple now. About three, I guess. But it wears you out even more when it's your own. Rudius knew that Sylphie was probably the most drained, obviously. <laughs> he would have to show his appreciation later. I guess that must be how I was born, too. Well, it's how everyone's born, isn't it? He didn't know much about meagered reproduction, but he assumed it was like humans. They couldn't be much different, right? <laughs> Why do you have to bring up this question? My mind went in like a million directions. Yeah, go... <laughs> He like does he knows nothing about this and then like Roxy gets pregnant and then it comes day for her to give birth and Lilia's in there getting ready and they got they got Roxy in the usual position for giving birth and then Lilia's all ready <laughs> and she just pukes it out. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's I my mind does that sometimes. Shut up. But no, the, the reason why I went to that whole route is my my mind. My mind immediately goes to the aspect that they're talking mentally and like something in the head or something like that. Just kind of birth out the head or something like that. I'm, I'm ruining it. I'm getting, it's getting worse. I, I gotta stop. I'll be giving birth like that eventually too, won't I? He's seen Roxy's face red. He slipped off his shoes, folded his legs underneath himself on the couch. Yes, I hope that I can ask you to do that for me. Rudy just wants to bang. <laughs> he doesn't care about producing more children. I don't know. It is one of the most troubling things around either because of Refugian's writing or just how he's writing Rudy as to be is Rudy's just never really internalizes childbirth and child rearing like I would assume that somebody was. And again, that's a lot to do with the fact that this dude just doesn't know what he's doing. At the time, Rudy's has no clue what he's doing. He doesn't understand what he's getting himself into. That's like the initial aspect of him being pretty oblivious about, all right, let's, let's get to baby making. And it's like, why? Oh, because I want a trophy that says I did this with Sylphie. That's not why you have a child. But then when he had the child, he was, he was overjoyed. And later on, he talked about with his guilt with leaving Sylphie behind, this was what I wanted. And I pushed this on her. And now I'm leaving her to handle it. So it's that moment where he realizes, or at least um, internalizes it. Yes, I hope he can do that for me. With Sylphie giving birth, that means he can start making a baby with Roxy. He was looking forward to it. Even if Sylphie had just delivered. He was really hopeless. Not that he hated himself for it. Not when he considered Paul had probably felt the same in the past. Man, it just feels like Paul's becoming his excuse every two seconds now. Poor Paul, he's rubbing your, your name all over in the mud. He couldn't wait. He thought with a laugh as Roxy, flustered, bright red, wrapping her arms around her body. Rudy, you got a seriously dirty look on your face. I was born with it. Probably perhaps something that he had before then, which yes, I can probably say he had a long time ago. Before he would start his routine, he had to announce the birth. The following day, he went out to the outskirt of the city, where a graveyard of nobles was nestled on a low hill. This is where they had put Paul to rest. Honestly, he thought that Paul would probably fuss over being lumped alongside a bunch of nobles. <laughs> Which, yes, we all know that Paul didn't have much care for nobles and the duties of nobles. He left his father, who was a noble. He went out to his own. He even mentioned to Rudius as he was going back to the refugee camp, you know, don't get caught up in noble stuff. If you have to, take that girl and go. 
He was basically saying, if Edis gets caught up in this, if you're getting caught up in it too, take her and run. He knew that most nobles were just out for their own good. However, Rudius knew that this place had good management. Rudius stood in the snow amidst a renoa styled grave marker. He didn't know if Paul was religious. He honestly seemed like the type that didn't worry about it. So he was sure that he'd forgive him if they made a mistake in that regard. Perhaps it would have been more ideal if they gave him a grave in Osra, where Buena Village once was. Paul had no connection to this land, but if they did bring him all the way out there, they wouldn't be able to visit them. Rudius had already informed Geese and the others of the location. They even visited as a group. Each person brought something they thought Paul would like. Alcohol, a short sword, that kind of thing. Geese and Talhan sat before it and drank themselves silly, before earning the gravekeeper's ire. <laughs> Rudius set to cleaning the grave, a bottle that he had purchased crooked on his arm. He dusted off the snow, shining it with a cloth. After setting the bottle in front of the grave, Rudius placed his hands together. He placed his hands together? Like, the stump and hand together? I'm wondering, and chat, don't say anything. Either this is a goof up, or Reese is gonna get his hand back. <laughs> Honestly, when I read this, I immediately, st my mind started immediately wondering, like, did he get his, did he get his hand back? And then I thought about it, cause like the last time that, the, the time skip that we had that he said he's gonna, you know, story for another time, was that he went back to the, Academy with Roxy introduced her to everybody and told everybody that he was back and I could totally see him walking up and Zenoba sees him and goes Master what happened to your hand slices off his own hand stuffs it into Rudius's hand and says Master hurry heal this It'll attach Rudius just heal And I can see Zenoba cutting off his own hand to give it to Rudius Because I've, I've seen stories like that where like it if you can't technically heal back something that's gone, all you have to do is like recreate that wound and then give something else to it and heal it. And so that was my immediate thought. Now he's gonna be walking around with his Zenoba hand and it'll be like a blessed child's hand so that he could block stuff with his his hand, like he could block blades and stuff. I know I'm going crazy. I need to shut up before the chat says something I don't want to read. It's probably just a miss typo. Anyways, back to serious mode before I I'm making fun right now because I know from here on I'm going to be destroyed, so it's my own fault for my own reasons. <laughs> After sitting the bottle in front of the grave, Rudius placed his hands together. Unfortunately, he couldn't get any flowers because there weren't any for sale. Not that Paul was one for flowers. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Drink first. Paul, father, my baby was born yesterday. A little girl. She's Sylphie's, so I'm sure she'll grow up to be beautiful. I wish you could have seen her. If Paul had seen her, I'm sure he would have fussed and cooed until Zenith scolded him. He would, he had, he'd have probably taken Rudius to celebrate. Both of them drinking to stupor. Then Paul would have made a move on Lilia, making Zenith exasperated. It was so in character. He could clearly picture it. The future that would have been if he was still alive and his mother hadn't lost her memories. I've made Roxy my wife. I've got two now, just like you did. I wish that you taught me how to mentally prepare myself for it. Now that Rudy's thought about it, maybe this is what Paul wanted to talk about when they were back in the labyrinth. The thing that he was talking about, I think what he's kind of referring to here is like when they went to that side room while Rudy was trying to figure out the whole teleportation room to get to the boss. Paul said that he wanted to talk about something, but he said that if he did, it would probably mess with morale. He wasn't wanting to scold Rudius. He was more of like a warning kind of thing. And so this, this does kind of go back to that whole conversation that we've had over the last quite a few Mushuka Mondays now was did Paul know about Roxy, and I think that he did. I honestly think that he was the entire time going, yeah, this girl's after this boy. I, I think I need to tell him, but I think what he wanted to tell him was that, so you know, Roxy wants you, but he didn't want to tell Rudius because then Rudius would say, oh, sorry, Roxy, I'm married, and then it would kind of ruin morale. That's what I thought was going with that. Not necessarily that he wanted to tell Rudius, hey, Roxy's after you, so just so you know, let's, let's get some pointers here, you know? It, I don't think that was really the case. But Rudius here is thinking that's a possibility. He knew Roxy had feelings for Rudius, and Rudius had feelings for her. He probably wanted to teach him how to prepare for it. Out loud, he said, it's not quite the same. I don't suddenly have two daughters, but eventually Roxy will get pregnant and have my child as well. I'm sure that's still far in the future, but I hope they grow to be as healthy as Norn and Aisha. Rudius had no intentions of knocking Lilia's teachings, but he wanted his children to grow as equals, strong enough to withstand when people called them half demons. Which, yes, I didn't, I didn't really dawn on me at the time, but yeah, that's technically true. With both cases, with both Roxy and Sylphie, their children will be half-demon. Again, technically, like, the beast folk and the elves and stuff are a lot more accepted than most other demon kind. 
but they're still half demons. In the end, they're still that. And yes, there's still the fear around the Migger tribe and the hair color. What if Roxy's baby comes out with more greenish hair? But I like this because again, it's acknowledging this idea that I don't like what Lilia was doing. I really don't like that. And I, I personally don't either. I didn't, I don't like that aspect of her telling Aisha to be different than Norn, to treat Norn with high respect because that's just something that really messes with a child's mind. And it obviously hurt them a lot. They're, it impacted them a lot. But Rudius is saying, I've seen these things and I've learned from them. That's really a lot of the things. Rudius doesn't really stand on a high horse most of the time. When he sees things that he doesn't think is good, every now and then he'll mention something like, you really shouldn't do it that way. It was like the whole situation with how to handle Norn and Aisha when they first arrived. He's like, I don't really want to do things the way that Lilia is saying in this letter. He's observing. He's not criticizing openly, but he's at least learning. Not just your own experiences and failures can teach you things. Sometimes other people's failures can. Apparently, Sylphie thinks that I'm going to take on another wife. I don't plan on anything of the sorts, but they do say that what happens once happens a third time. So maybe she's right. Again, another three. He's going to keep saying three. Rius wondered if Paul considered marrying Ghislaine, Ellen Lise, or Viera. It seems he had a sexual relationship with Ghislaine, so Rius suspected that he considered it at least once. Then again, Paul was a bit more open-minded than him, so perhaps he didn't think as far as marriage. That's another aspect that is kind of curious. Yes, technically with Roxy, he could just keep her in his relationship and not technically officially marry, but that kind of leaves the door open to a lot of issues. Rius said aloud, maybe I shouldn't overthink it either. Huh? When he directed his question at the gravestone, Rudius felt as if he could see Paul grinning. <sighs> a mischievous grin. A mischievous... Paul... Rudius felt as if he could see Paul grinning mischievous back, mischievously back at him. God damn it, I can't talk. <laughs> All Rudius could see was Paul's smile. He couldn't hear any words. But it wasn't if his Paul ever thought things through. But it wasn't if his... But it wasn't as if Paul had ever thought things through. Rudius was sure he racked his brains for years about things. It only made sense. There was few people in this world that live without thinking at all. Father. Father, I was a terrible son. <laughs> right back at you, Paul. <laughs> I'm a terrible father. I was a terrible son. This is technically... This is where it started sucking. <laughs> this is where I couldn't get through this story. This is technically something that he's already kind of established in the previous chapters. This idea of like him finally acknowledging that Paul was his father and that he was Paul's son. But this is so much more in the idea that he's taking what he kind of came to a realization of and what he sort of established with through his help with Roxy. And he's kind of putting everything together. Another aspect of what's so great about this writer is he's taking all these multiple things that hit Rudy's at the same time and he's, and he's figured each one out, but now it's right here. It's where it's kind of bringing it together, sandwiching it together and saying, it made this, this realization. That's what it made. Father, I was a terrible son. Carrying memories from my previous life. I didn't love you like I should have as my father. Rius took to his feet, gulped the bottle once. It was strong, burning like fire all the way down. Once he was done, he splashed him over the grave. But now I do see you. But now I do see myself as your son. Maybe alcohol wasn't the best for someone like Paul, who screwed up by drowning himself in the stuff. But surely, today, could be exception. They were celebrating a new life in this world. I finally understand now. I'm still just a kid. A brat who pretended to be an adult by using his previous memories. Rius took a swig and poured some for Paul. Again, until it was empty. Now that I have a child in the world, I'm a parent. I know I have to grow up right away. And in order to do that, I'll have to make a bunch of mistakes. Grieve over them. And change. Slowly. Gradually. I'm sure that's how you would have done it. So, I'll do the best that I can. Popping the lid on the bottle, Rius sat it in front of the grave. I'll come back again. Next time, I'll bring everyone else along. Many things had fallen into place with a great deal of pain and joy along the way. He'd repeat horrible mistakes, but it wasn't over. No matter how much he screwed up or got things wrong, it wasn't the end. He still had a lot of life to live in this world. And that's what he was going to do, live life to the fullest. So no matter when he died, he'd have no regrets.
And that is volume 12. I got through that so much better than I thought I would. I think it's because I got all of my system last night. I think it's because I got all of my system last night. I cried it all out there, so I didn't have to do it here. It still hurts, though. It still hurts, though. It is... God, that picture, too. The picture. Another massive grow-up point for Rudius. This cha- this volume, in general, is just massive grow-up for Rudius. Um, I think this is probably the most significant... I mean... <laughs> I'm be truthful. This is the only growth I've really seen in Rudius. Um... Of this caliber, like maturity, becoming an adult. This was like everything up at this point is kind of having fun. Yes, the whole ED arc is massive, but a lot of that's really kind of a personal physical desire that's really messing with his head. Um, this is like become an adult. Volume 12 is become an adult. That was make it to where you can become an adult. This is become an adult. Um, such insane amounts of growth that it kind of makes me wonder like what's what's beyond here is this technically like the no technically next volume is the halfway point but this really does feel like a chapter close like i said earlier volume 12 with how everything kind of concludes right here is really it kind of coming to a conclusion of everything that was that occurred from the displacement incident this is literally the end of that search Again, there's still so many wounds to be healed. They're still unraveling the secret of the displacement incident. Nana Hoshi being involved in it and her trying to get back home. There's so much stuff still involved with the displacement incident, but this does feel like an end to that. And yes, like I said, I still think it is Rudius becoming an adult and learning to and learning what an adult is. Like I said, I think with Paul finally connecting to him and understanding what a, what a parent is is the way for him to understand what it's like to be a parent. He's not going to have, unless he acknowledges what a parent is, he's not going to be able to be a parent. He's not going to know what he's doing. He's going to have to figure it all out, and he's going to make a lot of mistakes. This at least gives him that kickstart to understand what it is to be a parent. But yeah, a lot of parts of this really could kill me in the idea that, like I said, I wish that you could see her. I wish that you could see my daughter. I wish that you could see your granddaughter. Because again, like earlier, he, Paul was so excited for this. <laughs> And it sucks that he's not able to finally see that. He's not able to see his own grandchild. Now, granted, you know, depending on your perspective of religion and your perspective on spirits and whatnot, this idea that Paul is there, I mean, the, the fact that he looked over and seen him smiling, is that an idea of, are they watching and, and able to see it and smile? There's always that hope that those that leave before you are able to still experience your ups and downs god I hate this stupid story this whole this whole volume sucks <laughs> but yeah um that's again volume 12 uh the tragedy of the labyrinth the rescue of zenith and just the absolute destruction of rudius and really the break off point from his past self i i like I've said before, it, the the cool thing about the story has always been all these times that Rudius falls back into his old self. Like I said, with technically with the whole situation with Norn, Norn locked himself up, and all he could think about was when his family tried to pull him out and what they try to do and how he can apply that to trying to get her out, and then eventually realizing, oh, that's right, my brother, he tried. Even before then, what was the person before then? The last time he thought about being shut in, what was he thinking about? He was friend. So it was his friend, then it was his brother, and now it was his parents. Every time he goes back to that that world, I was back here, what I do, I was back here, what I experience, he's always thinking of a different person. So it does make me wonder, is Rius ever going to fall back into that state again? And what next time will he really examine? Because every time he goes back to that world, every time his mind goes back to when he was shut in, he always remembers something different. Always remembers somebody he failed. And yeah, technically, with the brother out of the picture, with coming to grips with his parents, what else would they be left to do? Is he finally going to leave that behind is a big question mark. Would this be the point, which me and my brother have kind of theorized for the longest time, which I can't really theorize with anymore because he <laughs> blasted through the novel series. Um, could this be the point which Reese finally gives up his old self? 
because that is the question mark. Every time he, chat, be nice. Every time he goes into the world of Man God, he always sees his body. He always sees his old, disgusting self. And that's always kind of been like this prediction being the idea that it's like an internalization of yourself. But I think he's grown so much that why would he still be thinking about that? Because sometimes whenever he does get back to that, he's like, crap, I forgot about this. So it does make me wonder if at some point he'll stop thinking about that. And maybe that's the point when he finally gives up this thing that still traps his mind and he finally becomes Rudeus, will that finally go away? And the thing that makes me believe that he never kind of lets that old self go is because he keeps acting like it. Again, what happened with this whole situation after Paul's death, he was still doing the same mistakes. He was still his old self. Maybe he's finally got to that point where he can finally shed that. But is the fact that he is his old self because he's internalizing it? Or is it simply something that has to exist there? We'll see. We'll see the next we'll see the next visit of the man god, which I'm sure is gonna be here soon. I don't know. Um yeah. Anyhow, yeah, this will definitely go down as easily shoot. It might end up being my favorite volume of the series so far. I mean it five and six are insane. Um, so it's gonna be hard, but I think emotionally for sure. This volume takes it. I mean, I cried quite a bit with um, Paul's chapter when they, they reunited in Milchen, but I don't think I've cried this much throughout this entire series as with this volume. It's just, and again, a lot of that has to do with um, personal. I mean, losing a father and dealing with people with uh, dementia and stuff like that. It just, all this stuff is so, it's so real. It's so with me. Every comment that Rudius makes in his mind is literally stuff I think about. The deja vu aspect. It's the deja vu aspect. I'm, I'm literally, Rudius is saying, why aren't you here, Paul? And it goes into my head going, I've said that. I remember saying that. When, again, like I said earlier, when Zenith goes up and grabs the the breastplate, it's like, I know that feeling of like, we are treating this as if she could still be there. And then this happens and you go, we're doing the right by taking care of her because she is still there. Um... Or just the unknown of, is it just her going in the motions and not necessarily something in there saying, that's my that's my husband's. I need that. Don't take my husband's breastplate away from me. Um, rough stuff. Rough stuff. But yeah, I'm looking forward to hopefully positive chapters going forward. Doubt it. <laughs> Doubt it. <laughs> Refuge is going to keep kicking me while I'm down. But um, yeah, uh, thanks guys for the, joining me on this journey once again. Uh went way longer than I thought it would, but I just kind of wanted to wrap up this volume, so hopefully the editing process isn't too bad. But, um, yeah. Thank you guys for joining me. Hope you guys enjoyed this Mashuka Mondays. As always, if you did, don't forget to hit that like button down below. And if you want to support this content, we have memberships, uh, Patreon, all that kind of stuff that you guys can support through. I greatly appreciate everybody's support. It means so much to me. It keeps this stuff going. Otherwise, support, of course, is by sharing out, letting other people know about it, and just your kind words. I, I greatly appreciate all of it, uh, no matter what I don't want people to believe that they can't support by any way but monetarily. Like I said, just your kind words and support is enough. It's what kind of keeps me going. I look forward to Mushoko Monday just as much as everybody else does just because I really do love this community. So that said, I hope you guys enjoyed. And until the next Mushoko Mondays, until volume 13, y'all take care. Yep, and if not for her... Yep, and if not for her slutty grand, <laughs> yep, and not for her, <laughs> yep, and if not for her, yep, and if not for her slutty grand, and yep, yep, and not, yep, and if not for her, yep, and if not for her slutty grand, it's been a while, Mistress Sylphia. Lilia spoke up. It's been a while, Mistress Sylphia. Lilia spoke up. It's been a while, Mistress Sylphia. It's been a while, Mr. Sylphia. He'd feel like he'd really become. He'd feel like he, he'd feel like he'd really become. He really feel like he'd, he, he feel. He'd feel like he really would. He really, he felt, he, f perhaps because healing magic, perhaps because of healing magic, it was probably, it was probably perhaps, it was perhaps because of healing magic that, it was prop, it was probably per, it was, but no, I don't think it, but I think it, but it isn't, but it is, but it is interesting. Ellen Lace and him going to Rapon, reuniting with Paul, finding Ellen Lace's whereabouts, map, I don't know, Lily had taken Rudius to the bath. 